Hi everyone, so in today's video we're going to talk a little bit about electronic spectroscopy, just some of the general principles and ideas um, behind it. There's a lot more kind of specific details and a lot of other things related with electronic spectroscopy that we could dive into but just don't necessarily have time um, for the sake of this class. Okay. So <clears throat> right, when talking about electronic spectroscopy, right, we're going to be typically talking about it for mini electron atoms. right? And so we'll just kind of review some of the things for many electron atoms, right? The fact that the, the electrons have to satisfy this Pauli exclusion principle, right? You, you um, typically follow Hund's rule where you occupy the lowest energy orbital um, first. And then if you have degenerate cases, you unpair electrons before pairing them up, right? Um, and then <clears throat> just note here that often, especially in this video, I'll use terms like singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, and so on, right? This is referring to the overall spin state of your molecule, right? Which which deals with kind of the difference between the number of alpha and beta electrons, okay? Um, <clears throat> and just note that, um, as we've been talking about, uh, for electron spectroscopy, okay, um, typical absorption emission spectra and things like that, you cannot change the spin state, this multiplicity, um, with the absorption emission of light, right? We talked about atomic spectra and how that, that um, multiplicity number couldn't change in atomic spectra. The same thing is for molecular spectra, okay? The spin multiplicity um, is not going to be changing through the absorption or emission of light. So if you're in a singlet state, you absorb light into another singlet state, okay? All right. So electronic spectroscopy, often referred to as like UV vis spectra, okay, um, is again giving you the measurement of uh, energy levels or the difference between energy levels and electronic states, okay? Um, there's a lot more details in terms of what are allowed transitions. Um, it, you know, you can work out the term symbols for um, molecular systems, right? And so it has to do with a lot of these term symbols and symmetry and things like that, in terms of what are allowed and not allowed. And there's, there's other factors that go into this, okay? But we will not go into those here, All right? The main selection rule that we'll kind of focus on is just again that you, especially for organic based molecules, your electronic state cannot change the spin of your molecule. So if you're in a singlet state, you transition to a singlet state. Okay. This this can be different for, for metallic systems, heavy metal systems. Um, this is potentially more allowed and, and more capable of happening, right? But we won't really focus on it here. We're just talking about kind of for organic molecules and things of that nature. You, you, your spin multiplicity does not change with the absorption or emission of light. Uh, okay. Right. And so again, for trying to find out what transitions are allowed or not, one needs to calculate the um, <clears throat> uh, the transition dipole moment, okay, which is related to the electronic state and the vibrational states. Okay. Um, the thing is, is when you change your electronic state you're often changing the kind of potential energy surface these atoms are on, which changes the vibrational wave functions um, that correspond to that electronic state. Okay? So each electronic state has a unique set of vibrational modes, vibrational states associated to it. So when you change the electronic state, you're also changing the vibrational state. So this transition dipole moment calculation gets broken into two factors, this, this electronic part, okay? Um, which <clears throat> there are ways you can approximate it, otherwise you can solve it through computational methods, right? And then this other part, which is refer which is the overlap, okay, between the initial and final vibrational states. Okay. So often when you do undergo electronic transitions, you also undergo vibrational transitions. Okay. And so part of the the, um, the intensity of a peak is related to the overlap between the initial vibrational state and the final vibrational state. Okay, so <clears throat> trying to kind of plot that here, right? Um, this overlap is referred to as the Frank Condon factors, okay? Um, and typically the largest overlap, right, is um, you can be determined, right, if I have a potential energy surface where I have my excited state E1, right, um, and my ground state, right, if I look at saying I'm in the ground vibrational state, okay, um, I want to excite up. Right, I draw a straight line from that ground vibrational state, OK? 
okay? And then I see which, um, you know, vibrational state has an over, uh, a wave function that has a maximum around where that straight line is, and the lowest energy state of that is gonna give me the best overlap, okay? Um, <clears throat> right, and so that's typically, you know, pictorially, kind of visually, what you can do to look at the best overlap. Right, there's ways to mathematically calculate this that we won't go into here. Okay. So <clears throat> one other common thing to, to talk about with vibrational spectra is what's called a Stoke shift. Okay. So a Stoke shift, right, is, is related to the difference in the peak of an absorption and an emission. Okay. So this change in energy, this is the Stoke shift. Okay. Um, and what's going on is often um, after you absorb into this electronic excited state, some time goes by and that molecule is able to relax and, and um, lower its vibrational state down to a lower energy vibrational state and then re-emit back down to the ground state. And that relaxation of the molecule is getting rid of some of the energy that it took in through the absorption of that light. And so now it has less energy to give up when it relaxes is back down to the ground state, okay, to the emission of light. And so that emission is always going to be at equal or lower energies than the absorption, okay? So for electronic transitions, you'll have the emission always at lower energies, potentially close to equal that of um, <clears throat> the absorption, okay, right? And, and the difference between that absorption and emission maxima is the Stoke shift, okay? And, and this is one way you can, so molecules that are more um, flexible, okay, more loose, more able to move and bend and things like that, those molecules will often have larger stoke shifts, right? Um, but molecules that are very rigid, okay, and don't have a lot of, of, of freedom of motion and things like that, very stiff molecules, those will have very small stoke shift because there's just not a lot of molecular motion and relaxation that occur, can occur after excitation. Okay. So <clears throat> kind of seeing this represented here, right? Um, right. So the Stoke shift, um, right, can see, right, increases as I go from A to B to C to D. Okay. So right, what this is really related to right, is, is due to these overlap factors as to where this, this Stoke shift is occurring, right? So the, this peak where the blue and red are overlapping here, right, this is the zero to zero vibrational transition, okay? Right, and notice, right, in every one of these four plots, A, B, C, D, right, the energies of these peaks are the exact same, right? So I'm not changing what's the energy difference in my vibrational states or my electronic states or things like that, right? Um, what I'm changing is, right, um, on this potential energy surface, what's happening is I'm shifting the potential, the, the upper potential energy surface to the right, okay? Um, and and um, what that's representing is essentially more, is that in your excited state, your molecules are able to relax and move and find a better minimum somewhere else in space for the nuclei, okay? Um, and, and so this is um, <clears throat> then causing different vibrational states to have better overlap with the ground state. Um, and so, right, so in this part D here, I have the zero, zero transition, then I have zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four, and zero, five. Right, um, and so right, that zero zero transition right always is at the same energy um, between the ground and the excited state, but now its amplitude is greatly reduced. Okay, um, right, uh, in in part D here because uh, of the um, kind of the. The, you know how easy my molecule can move around and things like that, right? Um, and and <clears throat> and so that's reduced. And, and then, right, what ends up happening is this zero to three transition for vibrational states, right? Is now the highest 
peak, okay? So now my stoke shift goes from the highest peak to highest peak, right? Uh, and so it becomes larger because of, of this effect of the fact that the overlaps are changing between the vibrational states of your ground and excited state. Um, and they depend on how similar the ground and vibration, the ground and excited state minimum are. Um, okay. Which again, if you have a molecule that has a lot of freedom, a lot of degrees of motion, it could potentially have very different uh, minima for the ground and the electronic excited state, which then causes um, very large differences in the overlaps of the vibrational states, which helps contribute to causing a very larger, uh, large stoke shift. Right, so this question here, trying to estimate which transition is a larger amplitude, okay, between um, V prime and V double prime down here. So if I start V double prime zero, draw a straight line going up, okay, um, right, what I see here is that V1, or V prime equaling one, happens to have the kind of best overlap because it has a maximum, right, where my V0 function has the maximum. Okay. All right, so, um, so those are kind of the details we wanted to talk about with respect to electronic spectroscopy of molecules, right? Uh, key points being that the, the molecule, right, can't change spin states, right? That um, there's this change in vibrational state with electronic state, and that helps contribute to this stoke shift, which is a difference between the absorption maxima and the uh, emission maxima in your UV vis spectra. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. And so, right. And, and that these absorption emission peaks will have different potential peaks, right. Um, depending on sort of the, um, different vibrational frequencies. And so often you can actually see the splitting between certain peaks in electronic spectra can give you information about a dominant vibrational mode that's changing with the change in electronic state. Okay. All right, so, so now though for the question posed on this problem, this is just dealing with stuff kind of related with uh, atomic term symbols, okay? So here, right, I have polonadium two plus, and the question is, is what are the two possible S and M sub S quantum numbers for the spin of this atom? So running out the electronic configuration of this atom, given here, right, got a bunch of stuff, okay? And so this is for the atom, now I'm going to remove two electrons, right? If it, um, right, when I remove these two electrons, they're actually going to be removed from the 5s orbitals here, okay? And so I still have the, the d orbitals filled up, but I no longer have electrons in the 5s orbitals, okay? Um, <clears throat> and the reason is, is because as you're starting to fill up the d orbitals, um, right, these d orbitals, are closer to the nucleus than the s. The d orbitals have an average distance from the nucleus that's shorter than that for the 5s orbital, okay? Um, so the 4d versus 5s. And so um, it happens to be that when you're filling up the orbitals, or the, yeah, these orbitals right with electrons, the 5s when 4d is empty is at a lower energy than 4d. But then what happens is you start filling up the d orbitals um, you're putting in electrons closer to the nucleus than the 5s orbitals are, and that is reducing the effective nuclear charge on the 5s electrons, which is then going to raise their energy, okay, um, and, and cause their energy to go up. And so then when you're removing electrons after you've added some electrons into the 4d orbital space, you're actually going to be more easily able to remove electrons from the 5s orbitals than you are the 4d orbitals. And so that's why we move the 5s orbital electrons here instead of the 4d, right? And so I have eight electrons in the 5d orbitals, right? So let's just assume, right? Uh, not assume, right? This is just an atom. So I'm gonna fill up, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So out of this, I have a total of three of these orbitals that are doubly occupied. So don't really care about those orbitals. Those electrons are paired up they'll give it contribute total S of equal to zero. So it's not affecting really anything, okay? So now I have these two electrons, right? Now they could be unpaired, they could be paired, they could be the same spin, could be opposite spin, right? So my possible values of S are when 
they're either, you know, say paired up, right, in the same orbital, in which case that has an S of zero and an M sub S uh, uh, equal to zero, or they can be unpaired like I have drawn in the upper right here, okay, where in that case, total value of S is equal to one, because I have a half and a half, and so then the M sub S values are zero or plus or minus one, okay? And so those, right, are the different possible values for S and M sub S, okay, for this cation, right? And so that's gonna do it for this uh, video on electronic spectroscopy, okay? Um, <clears throat> and next we'll start talking about uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy.